everybody. You're probably wondering what I'm talking to Adelia about. I don't know if you want to know. You want to know? You want me to tell you what I think you want me to tell you? You want me to tell you the truth? The truth. You want the truth. I'm not feeling it. I'm not feeling it. You want the truth? I mean, I just preached Sunday about the filling of the Holy Spirit. I got it written on my hand. I do. I've studied the passage. I know what the sermon is. I already started preaching it to some of you. But I ain't, I ain't feeling it. Oh, it ain't your fault. Well, it can't be my fault. Or... So we're just going to hold hands and sing. Uh-uh. No, because I've learned, I have learned, I've learned, whether you need the sermon or not, I do. Whether you get anything out of it, I hope I do. You say, well, you probably don't know what you're going to say. I preached the sermon to my dear wife on the way into church tonight. <laughs> but that song we just sang about revival, one, one thing I've noticed, <clears throat> it's not like you hit this stride and that you're just always then in revival. Come on, man. It, do, it just doesn't work that way. Or you hit this, you know, category and you're always filled with the Holy Spirit. It doesn't work that way. So the Lord knows I've asked to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Lord knows I've studied the word and the Lord knows what's going to happen. But if God doesn't show up, if Jesus doesn't come, uh, the word is still effective. The word is still effective. Whether I feel it or not is secondary. But I sure want to have that happen. That thing, you know, that thing. That's... Why, Mary, I nudged you a little bit. Now, Mary's new to our church, and she's probably thinking that's a weirdo preacher. Well, she knows I'm a weirdo preacher, by the way. Okay, she knows that I am a weirdo preacher. Do you know why? Because she knows me better than you guys know me. And you say, well, you must have known Mary a long time. I just met her a couple weeks ago. But she knows me better than anybody in this room. Do you know Why? Mary actually works for his production, and Mary is the one responsible for all my sermons on the radio. <laughs> Mary has to edit all my sermons. That's not an automatic if you're having to edit me. <clears throat> so I'm sure she listens and has to go back, should I cut that, should I not cut that? I think I'll cut that. Well, I don't know if you cut that. Anyways, she, she's the one that does all that. And then they moved to Amarillo, what, six months ago or something like that? And so she's got a computer. She can take her job wherever she wants to go. But she never came here like till three weeks ago or something. And I'm thinking, anyways, so Mary's my best friend. She knows me. She knows all these sermons, everything you hear um, on the radio. She heard it first. And... Uh, See, I'm already feeling better just using that to like, what, what does that have to do with it? Well, here's, here's the thing. Let me throw this in as an illustration. She can actually make me say anything she wants me to say. <laughs> she can make me say anything she wants me to say. She can take a word here and a word there and put them together. And I never said those words that way. Don't you ever do that, Mary. <laughs> Because way back in the day, we had a guy in our church. This is 20-some years ago. And so he used to edit all my cassettes by hand, old school. But what he would do, he would find choice little phrases that I would use, and he'd pull them out and pull them out. Some of them I can't repeat because he made them into, like, swear phrases. Not real bad, unless you're not listening close. Thank you, Mary, for never doing that. And by the way, we're on the radio live right now, so you have no control. I do. So I've rambled on enough. So what's, what's the point? Okay, here's the point for me. I'm about to open up the Word. I want the Word of God to speak to me. 
I want the Holy Spirit, while I'm sharing the word with you, I want the Holy Spirit to speak to you. I, I for sure want the Holy Spirit to be working in my heart. I mean, I've got illustrations, scriptures, all that kind of stuff. But, but I, want that, I want that flavor. I want that thing that I know. And so uh, God can give it, or sometimes he doesn't. If he doesn't, then it's a lot harder for Mary to put that sermon together. But if he does, then she can just hit play and let it ride. What are you saying, Pastor Bill? I need church tonight. Mm -hmm. I need church. There's something about worship. There's something about corporate prayer. There's something about church. I need it. I need it. And you do too. That's why you're here. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. Unless you already feel bad, then repent and get over it. We're here. We're here. The Lord wants to come in our midst, and the Lord wants to bless us. Yeah. And the Lord's desire, the Lord's desire is that our hearts would be freshly filled. The word would be not just information for our brain, but actually transformation in our lives, our hearts, that when we leave, that, that revival thing, we use that word, that spirit filled, we use that word that, I, I just want to keep singing to the Lord. Yes. Yes. I just want the Lord. Amen. That's, that's my goal. So you better cooperate. No. <laughs> you down for that tonight? You say, where are you going to get that? I'm not really sure yet, but I know what passages we're in. I don't know where the Lord's going to hit you. I don't know where he's going to hit you. Because if, if I'm being honest about revival, you know, usually that happens when everything's going right. Prayers are answered. Things are happening. Momentum. You know, it's looking good. But God doesn't do it that way. And if we're really honest, there's a lot of people in this room, things are going wrong. They're not going right. They're going wrong. And it's in times like that, which seems to be yeah, a long time now, there's so many things going wrong that somehow I, I think that affects me. I know it does. So what I need, what I need, and I want to start tonight with our scripture reading this morning. So if you have your Bibles, we're in 1 Kings. If you're reading through the Bible with me, this morning we were in 1 Kings in chapter 3. So turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 3, and uh, that's on page 410 of a seatback Bible. And I love this story, but I needed this story today in my life. Glad you guys are here. Glad we have our Bibles. And I'm glad, by the way, we are a Bible church. We just go through the Bible. We're going to talk a lot about that on Sunday. You know, it's the Word, the Word, the Word. There again, not information, but that we can hear the Lord Jesus. We can believe in the Lord Jesus. And we can walk in Him yes. and Him in us. We can get through life. Uh, Solomon, in 1 Kings chapter 3, I'm going to jump down to verse 7. Solomon just is the new king, David's son, just offered a thousand burnt offerings. And there in worship, he has a dream. He's actually, God's talking to him in a dream. Chapter 3, verse 7. Are you guys there? Solomon responds to this opportunity that he gets to ask the Lord for whatever he wants. Now, oh Lord, my God, you have made your servant king instead of, instead of my father David. But I'm a little child. I do not know how to go out or to come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to be numbered or counted. Therefore, give to your servant, here's what I want you to give me, give to your servant an understanding heart. I want to understand, I want to learn, I want to grow. I want an understanding heart to judge your people. That I may discern between good and evil. That I might know the difference between right and wrong. That I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? Of everything that Solomon could ask for, he asked for wisdom. He asked for discernment. He asked for a heart that can understand. And I, I want to know the difference between good and evil, right and wrong. These are your people, God, and I'm their king. 
I'm their leader. I want to understand them. I want to know what to do, when to do it. By the way, you're a leader. That's not just talking about, you know, the president or the king. It's not talking just about the pastor or a teacher. You're a leader. Somebody's following you. Your children, your grandchildren, your, your brother, your family, your neighbors at work. You're a leader. And the people that are looking to you, what should be our attitude? What should be the request that we have of the Lord? Lord, would you, would you show me? Would you teach me? Would you give me a heart that understands? Would you help me understand the people around me? Would you help me understand what you want me to do with them? Would you give me wisdom? Would you give me understanding so that I can know what's right and what's wrong? Should we go this way or should we go that way? Should I smack them between the head with the Bible or just comfort them, you know, with a psalm? Hey, Lord, these are your people. And, and I want to know how to shepherd them. I want to know how to lead them. Solomon's saying, I want to know how to be their king. So you're asking me what I want. Like, and Solomon could have named anything he wanted, but he asked for wisdom. He asked for understanding. He asked, I, I want to know what's right. I want to know what's wrong. I want to know what's good. I want to know what's evil. I want to know that. So that's my request. Can I hear an amen? amen. That's, hey, husbands, that's what your wives, that's what you should be praying as you lead your wife. Amen. Hey, wife, that's what you should be praying as you <laughs> try to follow a crazy husband. <laughs> I don't understand him. <laughs> Pray for wisdom. That, that is actually the sermon tonight. Yeah. That, that's a sermon. I, I need wisdom. You need wisdom. Especially when things are so dark. Yeah. Amen. You need wisdom when things are so dark. Because they're dark. Who can figure it out? God. What are you praying for? This was this morning's scripture. The speech... This request pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Then God said to him, because you've asked this thing, and you haven't asked for a long life for yourself, nor asked for riches for yourself, nor have you asked the life of your enemies, but you asked for yourself understanding to discern justice. Behold, I've done according to your words. See, I've given you a wise and understanding heart given you a wise and understanding heart so that there has not been anyone like you before you nor shall any like you arise after you can I see James chapter 1 verse 5 if any of you at Grace Church on Wednesday night lacks wisdom let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach. And it will be given to him. Now, let me tell you what that verse means in the Greek. We need to ask God for wisdom. If you ask him, he's generous with wisdom. You have not because you ask not. What should we be asking for? Well, oh, a long life. I want a long life. Well, I want to live as long as God wants me to live. But wisdom's more important than that. I just want to pay my bills. I want to have, you know, the money with the inflation and everything. Well, that's important, but wisdom's more important than that. I just want to have victory over all my enemies. I'll show them. Wisdom is more important than that. Matter of fact, if you have wisdom, then God just might come along and add those other things to you because that's nothing. Wisdom is the difference. When we talk about wisdom, we're not talking about just that you have information to know what to do. No, you have understanding with the people around you. Even if those people are evil. With wisdom... You not only know what to say, 
but when to say it. With wisdom, you know how far you can go, but then you have to stop and let God come along and kind of finish the rest. It really did strike me this morning, and then as I went through my day, there was several different opportunities with staff and people today where it was like, not the verse that hit him between the eye, it was the aha. That's what I need. Welcome to Esther, who needed wisdom, how to approach the darkest days of her life. Father, thank you for your word. I love how your word ministers to us, Lord, from the morning through the day. And then as I really dove into Esther, I couldn't help but notice how wise she was. How wise, how wise. Help us to see where that came from, but help us to see practically how she applied the wisdom you gave to her to solve the problem. The, the time frame of how that looks for Esther. And our problems are different. Our darkness, it's just dark. But wisdom, Lord, wisdom. And the gospel and the hope and the scriptures and the love and the understanding and a heart that's teachable. Help us, Lord, for the darkness that we face. So I thank you for tonight, and I thank you for your word. I thank you for the Holy Spirit. I pray that you would fill me, Lord, fill my friends here, that you would anoint us. I pray, Lord Jesus, you would come and bless us, that you would make a, a personal appearance here, Lord. And so we welcome your presence, and I thank you for this group, and I expect revival in my heart. Somehow, Lord, that only you can do that. I expect it. So give us wisdom is my prayer. In the great name of Jesus, and God's people would say. So I'm going to back up the truck a little bit to Esther, chapter 4, verse 13, just that we can pick up context before we bust into some new territory. So if you uh, have your Bibles, go back to Esther, chapter 4, verse 13, and I got that page as being page 602. And if you remember, this book is just full of the sovereignty of God. It just is. And yet the responsibility of Esther and Mordecai and Haman and Xerxes. And so what we've discovered already, you know, Xerxes got rid of Vashti and then the big beauty pageant, worldwide kind of thing. And Esther, her name means star. She's the queen for the day, not just the day. I mean, she's the queen, queen, queen of Xerxes. And you say, well, God can't use that. Well, don't tell God Esther or Xerxes, because she's got a whole book in the Bible named after her. And you say, well, what's so dark? Well, this is after the Babylonian captivity, and most of the Jews did not go back to rebuild the city. Most of them stayed in Persia. Like 1.6 to 2 million stayed in Persia. And at this time of Xerxes, this is like one of the greatest empires in the history of the world. He's got 100, 120 provinces. And so out of all those people, out of all those things, you know, here comes Esther, um, Mordecai, her cousin, her uncle, depending on how you interpret that. Um, he prompts her, he's checking on her, da da da, they're married. And then we saw how time goes by. Matter of fact, it was six or seven years. And really not a lot happened, at least in the text, until huh, Darth Vader shows up. <laughs> you know, here comes Haman, who his name means magnificent. You know, he thinks, he thinks he's it. But really he's like evil, 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 evil. And he rises to power. Mordecai drives him crazy because Mordecai won't bow to him. So he not only gets mad at Mordecai, but Haman takes that personally, and he gets mad at every Jew in the world. And so his goal, he's already a multimillionaire, but his goal is to exterminate every Jew on the face of the planet. 
It's interesting how that happens historically. That for whatever reason, the Jews are always tagged. They're always, the devil is out to destroy them. As recent as Scott Davies' lifetime, there I'm picking on you again, Scott. But Scott's old enough to remember Hitler and how Hitler destroyed six over six million Jews out to annihilate them. Where does that come from? The devil. Why? 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 Because God says way back in Genesis chapter 12, you know, those that bless you, I'll bless. Those that hate you or curse you, I'll curse. And what's so special about Israel? I don't get it. They were chosen by God that Jesus Christ is going to come through the tribe of Judah. By the way, my Savior is a Jew. Your Savior is a Jew. And if you're a Gentile, well, then you've been grafted into the nation, the vine of Israel. And that doesn't mean you're a Jew, but you've been grafted in to that root. Can I hear an amen? amen? You say, well, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? That's where it all ends. I mean, it didn't end at Calvary. You know that country is back in its land. That people, that language, that culture, that Bible, all of that. They just don't know Jesus yet. Boy, I'm so far off track, but I like it. And you say, well, what's that to you? That's why we fly an Israeli flag. Have you ever thought about that? Why do you fly an Israeli flag? Because that's the only country that makes it. What about the American flag? We've got that on our flagpole outside. It's secondary to Israel. Who everybody's thinking. I can tell. What does that have to do with Esther? Everything. Haman wants to get rid of every Jew. What he doesn't know is the queen's a Jew. He doesn't know that. Mordecai says, shh, don't tell anybody. Not even your husband, Xerxes, who's the king of the world, the man of the world. So she doesn't. And then here comes Darth. And he's going to kill them all. And, and then remember what happens what happens? He sets up Xerxes. And he, he tells kind of the truth, but really a lie. just said, you know, there's these people, they don't want to follow you. Well, that's kind of true. But, you know, they're still being, you know, submissive and everything. And we ought to just get rid of them. What do you think we get rid of them? By the way, I'll pay you, Xerxes. I'll, I'll actually pay you. And I did the math. I did the math. A third of a billion dollars. 330-some million dollars. Darth Vader's going to put that into the war chest of Xerxes. I'll pay you. And Xerxes says, okay. And he makes a law to exterminate every Jew in the world. Now, what I got to tell you straight up, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, you have to understand this historically. Once a law is signed into by the king, it can never be revoked. It can't be revoked. That's the way they did it. That's the way they did it. That's why when Daniel was thrown in the lion's den, that law had already been passed, and he's praying, you know, three times a day. And the king didn't want to do that, but he had to because that's the law. That law was above everything else for the Medes and the Persians. So once Xerxes signs that into law, that on this day, about a year out, all the Jews will be killed around the world. You can't change that law. So Haman's excited. Xerxes doesn't even know what he did. And then the posters go up. The word goes out. You know, Facebook lights up. And then everybody finds out because that was communicated to the entire world. And then Jews everywhere, they've got less than a year. That's, that's when cousin, uncle, Mordecai, sends a copy of it to Esther. Because she's just the queen. Or should I say, she is the queen. Placed by God to save Israel. I hope you know you've been placed by God. You've been placed by God into that marriage, that neighborhood, that job, those people. You say, I don't even like them. You've been placed by God. Well, I don't understand them. You've been placed by God. That's why you need wisdom. 
Remember chapter 4, verse 13. Mordecai told them to answer Esther, do you think in your heart that you will escape the king's palace any more than all the other Jews? For if you remain completely silent, cuz, at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. God will find somebody else. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews who are present with you in Shushan. Fast for me, fast for me. Neither eat or drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast alike, and, I, and so I will go to the king. I'll go, I'll go. Which is against the law. It's, it's against the law, but I'll do it anyways. And if I perish, I perish. If I die, I die. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded. Now it happened on the third day. So here's what happens. Esther says, okay, me and all my maids, we're going to fast and pray from food and drink. We're going to fast and pray on like, what do I do? What do I do? That's where wisdom comes in. You bet they were praying. <laughs> Show us what to do. I mean, the last somebody, you know, Xerxes off with your head, off the throne. What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Am I the only one in the room that doesn't know what to do all the time? I mean, am I the only one in the room that woke up at like 2.30 this morning and I got six different things. Let's go through all the stories. I won't bore you. Mary, you were not one of them. But I got, I got six different things. And so when I'm trying to shut my brain down to go back to sleep, you know, I'm over here with the water heater thing that I didn't even know about till 9.30 last night. And then the water heater things gets me going like, well, okay, so that has to be something. And then I got this other thing and I got, this, and then I got the real stuff, the real stuff with people, people, people. And you know, it's just like dark, not good. And then, then I have to figure that out because I can't go to sleep because I got six things going on. And so I'm trying, I'm trying to, I got to go to sleep. I got to go to sleep. <laughs> I got to preach Esther. And then I remember my sermon from Sunday. I need to be talking to Jesus. I'm still not sleeping. I need to pray for wisdom. I, mean, I, I need to pray that Jesus surprises me. Hey, Jesus, <laughs> would you surprise me? By the way, without going into some details, he did today. Some things I thought they were going to be really big, and it's like, huh. <laughs> it's not I just want to sleep. But... So I'm just saying, I'm saying, if you put yourself, not in my shoes, in Esther's shoes, the, the nation of Israel, the future Messiah, it's at stake. Or is it? What's really at stake is her part in this story, because if you don't come through, God will find somebody else. <laughs> he doesn't need you. He wants you. Well, if I perish, I perish third day rolls around and and this is where i see wisdom come in because she says okay i'm going for it but how are you going to go for it how are you going to make the application how are you going to do this nobody knows you're a jew darth vader doesn't know you're a jew all the jews are going to die nobody knows what you're going to do and xerxes is kind of out to lunch how, how are you going to do this? And then Haman. All, and so if you watch this, of course, she's wanting wisdom and applying. She knows where she has to get. She has to get to the point where like, I'm a Jew. Are you really going to kill me? But she doesn't start there. She doesn't start there. You see, wisdom will teach us as you're trying to figure out how to live in the darkness with six things that are keeping you up. Wisdom will teach you. The Holy Spirit will teach you. You have to take that in stages. You, you have to know how to entice people and love people and still tell the truth when it's right. You actually have to learn how to be nice. I keep writing it on my hand because I have to keep writing it on my hand. 
Lord, would you give me an understanding heart? Would you help me as I'm working with people? Because, you know, a lot of times I think they're just brain dead. Oh, no. They have people dying in their families. They don't know if they're going to live. They're going bankrupt. Their kids are going out the front door. And everybody's in darkness. Just to remind you, pretty much everybody's in darkness. And Lord, I've got a plan, but I need you to come through. And I, here's the other part that God doesn't tell you. Even though you've got A, B, he doesn't tell you what C is, or D, E, or F. Well, I've got to get to H. I know you have to get to H, but you just start with A. Don't go too far. So what we see with Esther, her idea is this. She shows up, King Xerxes, and if he has... If he doesn't put out the golden scepter, I mean, she's killed. You don't go knocking on his door. She hasn't been with him for a month, but she goes and she stands there in the royal robes. And, and sure enough, he says, come in. Woohoo! He's not going to kill me. That's good news. The plan's working. I must have dressed right. God is sovereign. And then he says, what can I do for you? And see, she could have jumped right to age. She could have jumped right to like, I'm a Jew, don't kill all of us. But she doesn't. She doesn't. You know why? Because of wisdom. She has a plan. So what she does, you remember what she does? She says, I've got a banquet. I just want you to come for a barbecue. I put together. It's really good. Really good. I want to invite you and Darth Vader. I want you to bring Haman, Mr. Magnificent, who doesn't know anything about this. He doesn't know anything. Xerxes doesn't know that. Esther knows everything. Of course, Xerxes says, you got it. Somebody go find Dart. Let's go. We're going to have barbecue. So they get in. So this is like A. This is the first phase, stage one. And then, you know, here's Xerxes saying, what do you want? Up to half my kingdom. Anything you want, dear. And she could have jumped to H. I just want you to take my life and not kill all my people. But she doesn't. She does something very, very strange. When, when he says, what do you want? And she said, well, I'd really like to have you to a, a banquet I'm going to give tomorrow. Just you two. You want to give us another banquet? That's amazing. And I can see Xerxes looking at Dart. And Dart's looking at Xerxes going like, huh. We got our lunch for tomorrow. You bet. You bet. And now, see, here's what I'm saying. Here's what I'm saying. If you read the story slow, well, why did she do that? Why didn't she just drop the, the whole thing right in his lap on day one? Because that's not the way you do it all the time. Sometimes, but not all the time. You have to know and understand who you're working with. You have to understand their strengths. You have, to, you have to trust the sovereignty of God. All I know for sure, Esther knew she wasn't supposed to pull the trigger, you know, on, on H on day one. She wasn't. She doesn't know all the stuff God's going to do. She doesn't know all the stuff that Mordecai, she doesn't know that. She doesn't have the book of Esther. She's, she's walking in the confidence of God. And I'm just here to tell you, I need that. You need that. Or you'll never go back to sleep. It took about two and a half hours last night and finally went to sleep. <laughs> and I woke up, I thought, this is not going to be a good day. And then I had some surprises. It's like, huh, huh. I didn't jump to, anyways, thank you, Lord. Thank you. So you're tracking with me, right? Yeah. This, I'm just bringing you up to where we're at. So the, the banquet's already scheduled for the next day. That's all, she, that's all the further she could go. But what she didn't know is that the moment Darth Vader, Mr. Magnificent, walks out and he's just had a banquet and been invited to the next banquet, like he, his head is this big, like I'm the, the best guy on planet. And there's Mordecai. And he looks at Mordecai and Mordecai wouldn't bow. He wouldn't bow. So Darth Vader goes nuts. He, he should be on top of the world. But one guy, one guy, one sin that he's picking up the offense. I'm not saying that Mordecai sinned. I'm just saying that's the way. And he, he loses it. Because until I kill all these people, I can't be happy. There's a part of Esther, I feel bad for Darth Vader. He's got nothing. He might be one of the richest, most powerful men in the world. He's got nothing. Esther's got everything. 
Mordecai's got everything. But there's darkness all around. So Mordecai is, or, excuse me, Haman is so upset. He doesn't know what to do. So he shows back up into his house with his wise men and his wife. And he says, well, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. You know, I'm the number one guy to this banquet. Number one guy to the next banquet. And then, you know, there's Mordecai. And he won't bow. So his wife, his wife, be careful what you tell your husband, wife. His wife says, well, why don't you get a big stick and stick him on it? Just build the gallows 75 feet high. And we saw last week what that is. That's a pointed stick. And they stuck it. Anyways, anyways. It was, it was horrible. Don't picture a telephone pole. Picture a little round stick. Really long. And they're just going to put you like a fish. That's what you need to do before the second banquet. And Haman says, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. And so then the gallows, the stick, is being put in the, the, the plot right there at Haman's house. Are you following with me? And you would think, well, it's out of control. It's not out of control. By the way, what the devil wants to do with you, whatever your enemy is, what's to do with you, but they might really want to do that to you. That doesn't mean they're, they're not in control. Part of the sermon is, you know what? You reap what you sow. Be careful what you sow. If you're an evil dark bather, well, you're, that's what you're going to get back. If you're Esther praying for wisdom, well, guess what? That's what you get back. So that's, like, like, that's the day the gallows is going up. And, th and then we've kind of walked through this. And what you're seeing, are these stages are being developed because Esther only knows that I've got to wait a day. I don't know what God's going to do, but I've got to wait a day. And so they're going to come back. I think I'm going to drop H on them on this day. So, but that night, in between banquet one and two, that, that night, the king can't sleep. Do you know why? Because he's got six things he can't figure out. <laughs> one of them's his hot water heater. He can't sleep. I don't know about you, but that drives me crazy when I can't sleep. I still have to trust God and pray for wisdom and talk to Jesus. Xerxes can't sleep. So he's like my wife. My wife, see, I have this theory. If you can't sleep, stay there long enough and you will. But Cindy will get up and she'll get something to start reading a book and everything. And so Xerxes has them bring to him the Chronicles, you know, read me back to sleep. It's really early, four, five, six o'clock in the morning. And they find a book of Chronicles of history and they start reading them a story that happened seven years ago when somebody wanted to kill Xerxes and Mordecai reported it. And then Xerxes says, did we ever honor that man Mordecai? No, we didn't. So see, Mordecai has been outside. Xerxes never met him. And he doesn't know what God's doing. He said, well, we, sh we should honor him. Isn't that great how the story is starting to go click, 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 click? Well, then the doorbell rings. You know who's at the doorbell? Darth Vader. Do you know why he's there? He's showing up to get permission from Xerxes to stick Mordecai on a pole. Xerxes doesn't even give him a chance because when he shows up, he says, what would we do? What do we do to honor a man? Somebody I really want to honor. And then Darth Vader thinks, well, you're talking about me. <laughs> well, he's talking about who you want to put on a pole, but he doesn't know that. So he says, well, you need to get a royal robe and a crown and a horse. And then you got to pick your number one guy to parade him saying, this is what the king does when he honors somebody. And Xerxes says, great. And Mordecai thinks he's talking about, no. Haman thinks he's talking about him, but he's talking about Mordecai that you want to stick it to him. And so then Xerxes says, great, you're the guy, get the horse, find Mordecai. And Haman, you see now, if you're Esther kind of watching this from the window thinking, huh, Oh, I didn't know that was going to happen. Didn't know that was going to happen. I'm told, I'm glad God, hey, H is looking pretty good because, you know, look at my uncle's being, you know, like a celebrity, some kind of thing, you know. And then Haman is so embarrassed and he, he goes back home. All of that, this is where we left off last week. I just wanted you to see. Chapter 6, 
Verse 10, then the king said to Haman, hurry, take the robe and the horse that you've suggested and do so for Mordecai. What? The Jew sits within the king's gate. Leave nothing undone that you've spoken. So Haman took the robe and the horse and arrayed Mordecai, led him on the horseback through the city square and proclaimed before him, thus shall it be for the man whom the king delights to honor. Afterwards, Mordecai went back to the king's gate, but Haman hurried to his house mourning. Oh, man, with his head covered. When Haman told his wife, Zerah, that and all his friends, everything that happened to him, his wise men and his wife, Zerah, said to him, if Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of Jewish descent, you will not prevail against him, but will surely fall before him. Dun, dun, dun. While they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs came and hastened to bring Haman to the banquet which Esther had prepared. Banquet number two. <laughs> Do you see what happened? Boom, 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 boom. Can, can, you, can you feel like Haman? Can you feel Esther? Wisdom. So the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther. And on the second day, see the first day, all this stuff that happened between the first and second day because somehow Esther knew how to have two banquets. At the banquet of the wine, of wine, the king again said to Esther, what is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted to you. What is your request? Up to half the kingdom, it shall be done. Now she could have answered that earlier, but she didn't. Do you know why? Can I see Proverbs 15, 28? Proverbs 15, 28. The heart of the righteous studies how to answer. The heart of the righteous studies how to answer. But the mouth of the wicked pours forth evil. Can I see Proverbs 16, 23? The heart of the wise teaches his mouth, adds learning to his lips. In other words, we're careful what we say and when we say it. So this is the second time in two days he's asking the question, but she didn't answer that the first day. She learned to keep her mouth shut because of wisdom somehow. Somehow. Then Queen Esther answered, verse 3, and said, If I found favor in your sight, O king. Notice the grace how she says this. If I found favor in your sight, O king. If it pleases the king, let my life, please let my life be given to me at my petition and my people, at my request. For we've been sold, we've been sold, my people and I, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. Had we been sold as male and female slaves, I would have held my tongue, although the enemy could never compensate for the king's loss. What? Well, I gave you banquet one, banquet two, and I waited, now that you ask me a second time, I'm just asking for my life. Can, can I, would you spare my life? And would you spare the lives of my people? What people? Well, see, we were sold. Who sold you? Well, a third of a billion dollars. She didn't have to, she didn't go in the details, but can, can, can you see Haman watching this after his wife said, hey, you're not going to win. So King Azarias answered and said to Queen Esther, Who is he? Where is he? Who would dare presume in his heart to do such a thing? And Esther said, The adversary enemy is this wicked Haman. Wouldn't you love to have that on video? <laughs> I would love to have that on video. You know, the whole thing and watching this, you know, following Haman around, and all of a sudden he's sitting there, and, you know, and the king going, what's going on? And the king's kind of responsible because he signed it in the law. So Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. Well, you better be. Then the king arose in his wrath, his wrath from the banquet of wine, and went to the palace garden. But Haman stood before Queen Esther, pleading for his life. For he saw that evil was determined against him by the king. I'm in trouble. Oh, man. When the king returned from the palace garden to the place of the banquet of wine, Haman had fallen across the couch, the couch where Esther was. Then the king said, will he also assault the queen while I'm in the house? By the way, if you think the Bible's boring, you haven't read the Bible in a while. This is, this is like a great soap opera, murder mystery, like look what's going on. 
And so if you see King Xerxes going like, I can't believe this. So he's walking in the wrath and Haman knows it. And then she's on the couch. That's just the call. She's on the couch. And the next thing, you know, there's Haman. Kind of, please, please. And somehow he falls on the couch. When the king walks back in, great, great. Uh, there's, this is a fable. It's, it's, just, it's, so it's not biblical. But according to Jewish tradition, the rabbi said, the angel Gabriel pushed Haman on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Bible, but I like it. Anyways, he, <laughs> he's on the couch with the queen and exerts he's losing it. Who's in charge? God's in charge. Who had wisdom? Esther had wisdom. Mordecai had wisdom. You see it being played out. Then the king said, will he assault the queen while I am still in the house? As the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Now Harbona, one of the eunuchs, said to the king, look, the gallows, the pole, 50 cubits high, 75 feet, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on the king, king's behalf. He just read that just a few hours before. Oh, maybe just two hours before. Who spoke good on the king's behalf is standing at the house of Haman, the pole. Then the king said, hang him on it, stick him. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that had been prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's wrath subsided. What? Yeah, put, it, put him. Do you see how the whole thing just shifted? Yeah. By the way, there's a psalm for that. Psalm 7, 14 through 16. Be careful. Psalm 7. Behold, the wicked brings forth iniquity. Yes, he conceives trouble and brings forth falsehood. He made a pit and dug it out. Has fallen into the ditch which he made. His troubles shall return upon his own head. His violent dealing shall come down on his own ground. Who put the pole up? Haman. Who got stuck on it? Haman. Haman worked his whole life to try to get to the top of the ladder. To have more money than anybody after Xerxes. And more power. He was the prime minister. You know what it got him? Nothing. Nothing. Zero. It's interesting. Um, you do reap what you sow, Galatians 6, 7. I also, you know, from Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. God is in charge. And even when it looks like the devil's winning, no. When, when Hitler took out 6 million Jews, do you know what it did to the nation of Israel? Put them back in the land. And the world was sympathetic to that. When the brother sold Joseph down the river, you know what it did? Put Joseph as being prime minister so that Israel could even survive. God's in charge. Guzik said this on this story to this point. Can I see the quote by Guzik? The death of a substitute satisfied the wrath of the king. In the case of Mordecai and Haman, it was the guilty dying in place of the innocent. Haman dying for Mordecai. In the case of, of us, the gospel and Jesus, it's a matter of the innocent dying in the place of the guilty. There's still a problem though. Chapter 8. What's the problem? The law. The law is still a problem. On that day, King Azarias, excuse me, on that day, King Azarias gave Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told how he was related to her. And, of course, that's all coming together uh, in the story right there um, in chapter 8. So the king took off his signet ring. That's all of his authority, which he had taken from Haman and gave it to Mordecai, who's now the prime minister. And Esther appointed Mordecai over the house of Haman. Dun, da, 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 dun, da, dun, da, da, da. Guess where all his property went? To Esther and to Mordecai. Guess where all the authority went? To Mordecai. Guess who's now the right-hand guy of the world? Mordecai. But there's still a problem. Now Esther spoke again to the king. 
she fell down at his feet, implored him with tears to uh, counteract the evil of Haman the Agite and the scheme which he had devised against the Jews. And the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther. So Esther arose and stood before the king and said, this is actually H in my scale. If it pleases the king, and if I found favor in his sight, and the thing seems right to the king, I am pleasing, and I, I am pleasing in his eyes, let it be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman, the son of Hamidath, the Agite, which he wrote to annihilate the Jews who are in all the king's provinces. For how can I endure to see the evil that will come on my people? There's like two million Jews. Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my countrymen? Well, the problem is it's already written. It's already a law. You cannot revoke the law. You can't do that. You can't. It's law. The day's set. You can't change it. Oh, but you can write a counter degree. You can't change the law, but you can have a new covenant. You can't change the justice of God, but he can be the justifier. The law is the law. Then King Azariah said to Queen Esther and Mordecai the Jew, Indeed, I've given Esther the house, all of the inheritance of Haman. And they've hanged him on the gallows because he tried, he, he tried to lay his hand on the, all the Jews, on the Jews. You yourselves, Esther and Mordecai, you yourselves write a decree concerning the Jews as you please. In the king's name and seal it with the king's signet ring. For whatever is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's signet ring, no one can revoke. In other words, let's, let's write a second law to preempt the one that's still coming. That date is still on the calendar. But what if we come up with, okay, you guys figure it out. We got nine months. We got nine months. So write whatever you want. Whatever we want. Write whatever you want. There's the ring. We'll make it law so that by the time we get to that D date, everybody will know I'm for you guys and God is on your side. Are you tracking what's happening here? So uh, Haman, it's not Haman, excuse me, Mordecai and Esther. So the king's scribes were called at that time, verse 9, in the third month, which is the month of Sivan, uh, on the 23rd day, it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded the Jews, the satraps, the governor, and the princes of the provinces from India to Ethiopia. This is a big, a lot of places. 127 provinces in all, to every province in its own script, to every people in their own language, and to the Jews in their own script and language. Mary had fun trying to get that in a sermon. Okay. And he wrote in the name of the king, Azariah, sealed it with the king's signature, and said, sent letters out by couriers on horseback, Facebook, Twitter, everything you think of, riding on royal horses, bred for swift steeds. Bless you. In other words, we got to write it. We got to get it out to the world. You see that? There's an urgency. There's an urgency. By these letters, the king permitted the Jews who were in every city to gather together and protect their lives. Okay, <laughs> they think they're going to kill you in nine months. Well, what if you get together and just protect your own lives? To destroy, kill, and annihilate all the forces of any people or province that would assault them, both little children and women, and plunder their possessions. On one day in the provinces of King Azurias, on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, Adar. a copy of the document was to be issued as a decree to every province it published for all the people so that the Jews would be ready. The Jews will be ready on that day, D-Day, to avenge themselves on their enemies. The couriers who rode on the royal horses went out, hastened and pressed on by the king's command. And the decree was issued in Shushan the citadel. Dun, 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 dun. Can I hear an amen? amen. What, what just happened? Well, that law is still in place, but guess what? We'll write a new law. You guys can do whatever you want to do so that that law never gets here. That's what it is. The law won't be revoked, but now you can do whatever you need to to protect yourself that you never get there. Well, how can you do that? I'm king. I'm going to write a new law. How about a new covenant? 
You can't go back and change the law. You can't. You can't just say it doesn't matter. It does matter. By the way, Ezekiel says the wages of sin, it doesn't say it exactly like this, but we're all sinners and the penalty for being a sinner is death. Paul says it, you know, in Romans, the wages of sin is death. And so how do we get around that? You can't get around it. It's part of the law. It's part of, well, I'm not a sinner. Yes, you are. You're a sinner. What's going to happen to me? You're going to die. And then you're going to be judged according to the righteous judgment of God. Are you tracking? And there's no way around it. Oh, unless the king writes a new law, a new covenant, and says it like this. I'm not taking away the first one. I'll just be the substitute for you. I'll take your sin and I'll die for it. How about that? so that you get love and mercy, a gift, but I'll pay your price. Now, wait a minute. In Romans chapter 6, that means you're just and the justifier. It's Romans chapter 3, excuse me. You're just. God is just. God is just. He will not compromise his justice. It's the law. It's his holiness. Oh, but I'll be the justifier at the same time. I'll put my son on a tree to pay the price for you as a substitute. Because you're guilty, so I'll put my innocent son on the train. How about that one? Well, what's that called? The gospel. That's good news. What do we have to do? Would you get that word out there? Would you get that on Facebook? Would you get that on Twitter? Would you get that on radio by grace? Mary, don't mess that up in the sermon, but would you get that out there? That there's a gospel and there's only so much time. What happens at the end of the time? D-Day. D-Day is still coming. It's still coming. The tribulation is still coming. Judgment's still coming. Unless you know Christ. Well, what should we do before then? We'll get the word out and enjoy the Lord. You say, where'd you get that? I read the rest of the chapter. By the way, something happened. I, I can feel it now. Thank you very much for letting me walk, get right there. Because see, here, here's the, here, this is just true. You don't feel it until you get to the gospel. You don't feel it until you get to Jesus. Or else we just got an ancient story about, you know, king and a queen and Darth Vader. Okay. No. But when you get to the gospel, now you're talking my life. When you're talking the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, and there really is a new covenant? Yeah, there is. There is. The best part about the new covenant? You can rejoice in the new covenant before you get to D-Day. You can rejoice in Jesus, even though the fullness of the darkness is still coming, because he conquered it. That's why at the end of this chapter, verse 15, there's an urgency with the new decree. So Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white with a great crown of gold and a garment of fine linen and purple. While wow, he's, he's really decked out. He is the prime minister. And the city of Sheshen rejoiced and was glad. Why is everybody glad? Because they loved the Jews. I mean, the Jews were really fitting in well at that point in time with Persia. And so the whole city is rejoicing. The Jews had light. Can I hear you say light? light. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. I mean, the Wanted dead or alive posters were everywhere up until this whole story happens and Mordecai and Esther and the sovereignty of God. It's where they had light, hope. I hope you have that. We have that with Jesus. I hope we enjoy that. The world doesn't have light. The world doesn't have any kind of gladness, joy, or honor. They don't. Whatever little bit they think they have is false. We have the light of life. Yep. We have the Lord Jesus. Yep. We have our substitutionary atonement with Christ. Yep. I have my salvation. Yep. I have the Holy Spirit. Yep. I have an inheritance coming that's going to blow your mind. Yep. And you say, yeah, but I'm going to live in the same house. I know it's a really big house. <laughs> really big. Really big. You say it hasn't happened yet. It doesn't have to. 
D-Day hadn't happened yet, but they're living in light of the new law. The Jews had light, gladness, joy, and honor. And in every province and city, whomever the king's command and decree came, the Jews had joy, gladness, a feast, and a holiday. Then many of the people of the land became Jews. <laughs> what? Many people of the land became Jews because of the fear, because fear of the Jews fell upon them. I, I can't help but rewrite that. I mean, I know that's true for where they were living in that time frame. But I can't help but think that many of the people in Amarillo became Christians. Because the love of Jesus, the wisdom of Jesus, the love of the church fell upon them. It will take wisdom and understanding and patience and love. Be nice, be nice, be nice, be nice, be nice. Boldness to speak the word at the right time. And let the gospel, if we're going to brag, I'm going to brag on the gospel. If we're going to run, run for the gospel. Amen. Amen. The plan is to finish Esther next week. We will see. <laughs> Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it's practical, Lord, with where we live and the people you put around us. I pray that I would have wisdom, Lord, in my home with my wife and my neighbors, the six things that keep me up at night. Pray, Lord, that you would fill us with your spirit and that the joy of the Lord, sons and daughters of the King, a kingdom that is sure to come and yet already in our hearts. We look at Israel in their land and we know there's a lot of things that still have to happen to her, but she's in the land. She's in the city. She speaks the language and her culture and her traditions, Lord. They're all intact and she's looking to build a temple and here we sit. The world is dark. It seems to get darker. I pray that you would give us wisdom to understand that we have victory in Christ. And the future looks really, 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 really good for us. And in your sovereignty, you placed us at this crossroads of history that we get frustrated with. I do. And yet if you're talking about opportunities and an exciting time to live, it's now. We've watched the world change so much the last two and a half years and it's probably going to continue in that direction. How we thank you for the gospel of Jesus, the new covenant. So help us, Lord, that as we leave this place, that thing that we call revival, that filling of your spirit, that joy, the light of the Lord himself would guide us. Thank you for the book of Esther. Give us wisdom, I pray, with the darkness we fight against. For the glory of Jesus, all God's people would say, I love you guys.